straight to Africa, the extraordinary journey, life and legacy of Nomzamo Winifred Madikizera Mandera. Some critics say in many ways she was the mother of the nation. South Africa is the most industrialized and arguably the beacon of hope of African democracy on the continent. Married to Nelson Mandela, otherwise known as the Madiba, for 38 years, she was a courageous and fearless fighter against apartheid and other forms of oppression. But Winnie, affectionately referred to by her admirers and supporters, was not without controversy. That's coming up next right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America headquarters here in Washington. I am Shaka Sali. And hello to all of our viewers and listeners on the continent and elsewhere. I'm Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick. I'll be your social media reporter. Today, it's a discussion and analysis on the extraordinary life and legacy of Winnie Madikizera Mandera. And coming up later, you have weighed in on our topic through emails, Facebook and Twitter comments. We'll reveal some of your feedback. That's straight ahead here on Straight Talk. We look at this profile of an anti-apartheid icon, a strong and fearless giant, but who was also perhaps a complicated and controversial leader. My colleague Paul Cisco has more on the story. We start with this image from Kenya's Daily Nation. Her husband for a time, Nelson Mandela, died December 5, 2013. My wish is that South Africans never give up. Another who lifted the soul of the nation. Bring back Nelson Mandela, bring him back home to the soul Jazz trumpeter and anti-apartheid activist, Hugh Masekela. Mama Winnie Medicazella Mandela joined them in death Monday, April 7th. She was 81. Winnie was hailed as the beautiful mother of the nation. She was not a favorite of liberals, a nightmare to the unjust, and a relentless leader for the oppressed. I don't relent and retreat from a fight. That's me, Winnie Madikizela Mandela. She was imprisoned many times beginning in the 1960s and often spent weeks in solitary confinement. To those who oppose us, we say, strike the woman, you strike the rock. I will continue the struggle for a free and equal South Africa. In 1976, the year of the Soweto riots, her house was burned down. She was banished from the township to a remote rural area. If you are to free yourselves, you must break the chains of oppression yourselves. Nelson's first of 27 years in prison was 1961. As the older generation of her husband was arrested and silenced, she found new anti-apartheid allies with the 70s generation. Igniting the youth of Soweto into resistance. They think because they have put my husband on an island that he will be forgotten. They are wrong. The harder they try to silence him, the louder I will become. U.S. civil rights activists Angela Davis and the Reverend Martin Luther King were important influences in her life. She maintained close relations with important black leaders around the world, as well as traditional and political leaders from all walks of life. There is no longer anything I can fear. There's nothing the government has not done to me. There isn't any pain I haven't known. The Mandelas were married in 1958 and divorced in 1999. Apartheid ended in 1991. Nelson Mandela's presidency lasted from 1994 to 1999. His death on December 5, 2013, only fueled her activism and call for justice. We cannot pretend like South Africa is not in crisis. It is only when all black groups join hands and speak with one voice that we shall be a bargaining force which will decide its own destiny. The life, activism, and spirit of Winnie Madikizela Mandela will forever be synonymous with the pursuit of equal rights for women and the never-ending struggle for liberty and justice for all people. Paul Sisko, 
VOA News, Washington. Thanks, Paul, for that report. Uh, for more on reaction to the ongoing remembrance of Winnie Madikizera Mandera, my colleague Darren Taylor joins us by telephone from Johannesburg. Good evening, Darren. Good evening to you, Shaka. How are you? It's a very, very long time since I last interacted with you, Darren. Yes, yes, it has been too long, but probably, uh, yeah, longer for me because uh, not sure how you remember me. <laughs> <laughs> of course I do. Now talk to us about uh, the mood on the ground. What is the mood like on the ground among South Africans? Well, you know, this is Africa. You know the place pretty well, uh, Shaka, and it's uh, not really acceptable to speak bad things about uh, people who have just died. So at the moment here in South Africa, what we've got is, con is basically a big concentration on the good things uh, that Winnie did and condemnation of um, the international or the, certainly the international media who um, have uh, brought up the bad things that, that she did. Now, to what extent does that really matter, given that uh, the people, at least of South Africa, uh, look like they're united, really, in celebrating Winnie's passing away? Exactly, yeah. You know, I thought initially myself that some of the uh, international reports were pretty much over the top, just concentrating on the bad things she did. You know, I, I really don't think those people understand what uh, she went through and how South Africa was in the, in the 1980s. And also the, the, the actual brutality that she suffered, not getting sanitary pads, for example, in, in prison, um, isolated, no contact with friends, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we can't all be Desmond Tutus and Nelson Mandela's. There is room as well in struggles for people like Winnie Mandela, as forward as she was. You need leaders like her as well to step into those fires. And um, I think that's what she did. She always maintained contact with the people, always a time for the poor. But um, as uh, the previous reporter said, and as you know, she was also a very flawed person. What kind of person was Winnie from your vantage point? Because... Uh... I know that uh, you had the rare opportunity of interacting with her a couple of times. Well, for me, Shaka, what uh, makes her so meaningful and, and fascinating is that uh, more than anyone else, at least for me, she was the human face of the struggle against apartheid. She represented the reality and complexity of apartheid. Um, I'd argue that Nelson Mandela, for all his greatness, for his undoubted role in preventing a race war in South Africa, did not represent the reality of apartheid. The white supremacist government had disappeared him into prison. South Africans didn't know how he looked. They didn't know how he sounded. He had become a phantom. So enter Winnie Mandela with her courage and, above all, her flawed humanity, to be the face of the war against apartheid in the 1980s when our country was really literally on fire. Um, in the middle of this fire stood Winnie, urging the people to revolt, to fight, to resist like she was. She had the fury that the angry masses wanted, and maybe we needed that in, in, in our history at the time, as, as shocking as this might sound. Um, you know, this was fury that couldn't be provided for obvious reasons by Mandela, certainly couldn't be provided by people like Archbishop Desmond Tutu with his philosophy of turn the other cheek. Um, she was a person of contrasting faces, always helping the poor, yet never slow in flaunting her wealth, extravagant in dress and personality. She said, on, one hand, every, on the one hand, everything I do, I do for the people. Yet she was a useless parliamentarian who hardly ever attended parliament to represent the interests of those people. She was the mother of the nation, yet she failed to protect the child activists entrusted to her care. And as the Truth Commission itself uh, found, simply looked the other way when her notorious bodyguards murdered them. But you know, Shaka, mother of the nation, well, you know what? Mothers make mistakes. Mothers are human beings, and Winnie was a human being for all to see. Very you know, very, it was the sex. Very interesting. It was the sudden. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Very interesting, Darren. Uh, you know as well as I do that uh, scholars say that when it comes to history, 
uh, if you really want it to be favorable to you, you either write it yourself or commission someone to write it on your behalf. How do you feel that history will judge winning? <laughs> I would hope that she goes down in history as a great, albeit flawed, South African. She was big in all senses of the word. And I'd hope that people remember that while apartheid bred Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu, so too did that horrific system breed someone like Winnie Mandela, who also led our country into freedom. Um, it might not have been the, uh, in the kind of way that many out there would have liked, but if you had any experience of this country in the 1980s um, and early 1990s, you would realize at least or have empathy for some of the things that she did. You would be able to realize that, you know, this, this was a human being, made mistakes, but deserves to be up there in the pantheon of, of great Africans. You know, there are some people who have suggested that uh, whereas Winnie was in fact fighting against apartheid, she was simultaneously perhaps also fighting another struggle. And this was a struggle against male domination. That in the end, Winnie in fact won against apartheid, but probably lost the war against male domination. How do you react to that? I would, I would go along with that, but having had personal experience uh, with Winnie, um, and I don't want to insult uh, women in any way, but you know she didn't, and many times didn't come across as a woman, and I don't think many, I think many people in the ANC didn't didn't see her as a, as as a nurturing woman sort of type. Um, they sort of forgot that she was a woman. She was use, useful to them, of course, um, as, a, as, a, as a tool. That sounds a bit negative, but um, certainly as a, as a populist tool when in garnering votes, et cetera, et cetera, and in garnering fury against the struggle, she certainly was most, uh, most useful. But like you, like you said, you know, we've still got a long way to go here in South Africa with regard to... Uh, uh, women's rights, and um, while Winnie might have been seen as certainly defeating the patriarchy, um, she didn't, she hasn't, things have improved, but she didn't change much. If you look at it from that perspective, she didn't change much for women on the ground as we see now here in South Africa. What about uh, some who uh, have characterized her as someone that uh, uh, was really unconventional? Uh, that she was uh, the type of person, really, who happened to be a rebel within a rebellion. Is that uh, a fair assessment of Winnie, the win at least you apparently knew? Shaka, would you mind uh, repeating that? I was saying that uh, there are some people who said uh, that Winnie fit the characterization of being a female or a woman who happened to be unconventional. And that, um, in as far as the ANC was concerned, she was really a rebel within a rebellion. Um, are, are you say she, she, that, that that they regarded her as a as a as a rebel? That is correct. <laughs> yes, definitely. I think many people in the ANC were, were scared of Winnie. They were scared of her popularity because, like I said, she would never attend Parliament. She, uh, <laughs> she wasn't willing to, to really take any of their nonsense. She knew she was popular. She loved being popular. And, um, the, and you know, repeatedly, without really going out there and canvassing votes or, or looking for popularity, they would vote her uh, the, you know, uh, like six, I think, six on the list of, of, of ANC leaders. So I think to, to a great extent, she was marginalized in the ANC. And um, it is sad, but not unexpected to see certain ANC leaders now, certainly in the build-up to, to her funeral, who are standing on podiums and um, exalting her and putting her on a pedestal, when we all know behind the scenes how much they marginalized um, uh, Winnie and um, insulted her. 
uh, although at times it might have felt that she deserved it because you know she wasn't <laughs> she could be very badly behaved as well. We we we, we know um, how that incident happened when she would always come in late and try to steal the limelight from other ANC leaders. When uh, Thabo Mbeki was president, for example, she came in very late, strode onto the stage, and they got into a bit of a scuffle. I think he, he knocked her hat off. Uh, you know that was Winnie. There was always drama around her. So I think there's there's a lot still to be learnt, and um, but I, I do know for a fact that there are many people that are genuinely sorry that Winnie is gone and respect her, of course, but um, marginalised her within the ANC and, and were frightened of her and were glad that she actually in the end did not become a, a true political force within the ANC. She left the uh, the politics. To, to these guys, to the present ANC leaders. And, um, yeah, she continued being the voice for the people and was immensely popular in her way, but far away from the political limelight. On that note, uh, thank you very much, uh, Darren, for your insight. Thank you, Shaka. I really appreciate it. You're most welcome. Now, joining us here in the studio are two distinguished guests. Sandra Rutley, executive producer for television and video with the Futuro Media Group, and Dr. Piwok Hudle Muyandu, professor of African Studies at Howard University, a native of South Africa from Durban. I have to say, frankly, that uh, I am profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host the two of you on Straight Talk Africa. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you, Shaka. You're most welcome, Sandra, and especially with you, of course, uh, being the first time to be on the show. We hope you'll be back. Thank you. You're most welcome. Later in the program, we'll give you, our audience, a chance to call in with your question or comment. The number to call is 202-619-3111. The U.S. country code is 1. Let me come to you, uh, back to you, Sandra, immediately. Um, how did you uh, feel? What was your immediate reaction when you heard that Winnie had passed him? Well, I think that um, when people that we know or have spent time with um, join the ancestors, I call it a multimedia experience. You begin to have flashbacks of those conversations that you had and the things that you experienced. And so I, I began to really reminisce and to think about the, the times that the comprehensive blocks of time that I was able to spend with Winnie and to be in her presence and um, and it's interesting um, Shireen Hasim who was a political scientist at the University of Witzratisran basically made a comment that no other woman in life or after occupies the space that Winnie Mandela does in the history and politics of South Africa and I would agree with that that I think that um, and possibly even in the African diaspora and in, um, in the world relative to the black world. I was thinking about that, maybe Queen and Zinga of Angola, maybe, maybe Harriet Tubman, but there are very many mm. women mm. who have carried the historical heft weight, um, have had the, the, the stature, have also experienced a level of challenge, and as, uh, as the prior um, points of view that were expressed, obviously a very complex woman, um, but uh, as someone said about her recently, which uh, a quote that I really like, that um, she, um, she never befriended the enemy. She was always um, on the side of the people and was always an advocate for the underdog. Mm -hmm. and, um, and she was a human being. She, she was a flawed person. But I think that um, part of what... It, isn't taken in consideration as apartheid is a state structure and, and state system mm -hmm. that w basically created a context for violence in South Africa. Mm -hmm. There are at least 30 years of research that's been done about terror and violence in South Africa and how apartheid actually established a triggering mechanism, if you will, for how people responded behave and, and behaved, not stuff, just yeah. um, no. uh, the minority relative to, to the black population, but also internal to the black population as well. Mm. And so somehow the characterization that, you know, when he was a violent person or, or promoted violence, I think that um, that does not take into account mm. the context of the history 
uh, of, of South Africa. You know, I was going to ask you, of course, uh, the fact that uh, you interacted with her uh, many times and uh, worked with her very, very closely. I, I only had the opportunity to have a cup of coffee with her in Soweto at uh, her cousin's, actually sister's restaurant, <laughs> opposite the, uh, uh, the old Mandela house, which is now a museum. Um, but you interacted with her a lot. Um, some reports have suggested that uh, she was inspired, among others, by the young lady in America called Angela Davis, and obviously the civil rights movement. Any truth in that? She never mentioned Angela Davis. We never had a conversation about Angela Davis, but I just want to tell a personal story that to me, even though it may look like it, I'm talking about myself, it kind of exemplifies who Winnie was. Mm -hmm. um, before going to South Africa for the first time, uh, I went to Lusaka, Zambia, and I spent time with the ANC, Oliver Tambo, a good friend of mine, Willie Kodasili, South African poet, etc. When these, was that? So we're talking about 30 years ago. Okay. This, this is 1988. Correct. Um, much of the leadership of the ANC had not been in the country since the late 50s. The ANC was banned in 1960. Right. And they, the, the organization was not legal until 1990. So there's a 30-year span where basically most of the people in the country, especially the leaders of the ANC, are either in exile or either in jail. And so Winnie, Winnie is there, really mm -hmm. kind of as a tall tree. Mm -hmm. um, and so because the, these older guys hadn't been there in a long time, they were saying, well, when you first go in, we're going to have to, you're going to, have to go underground. We're going to have to create a whole identity for you as an ethnomusicologist. They had someone flying in with me who was carrying my equipment. You know, you can't let people know who you are. They said, you can't take anything with you to identify yourself or your mission. And so I get there, and I contact someone with the Free Mandela Committee. They immediately take me to Winnie's house. And... Um, you know, and they're saying, we don't have time for all that subterfuge. We need to get right to it. I was there to do a documentary on the life of, of Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. So Winnie is walking out of her house, and I'm walking up with two of her people that she knew, and kids from the neighborhood are coming up at the same time. The three of us meet kind of in, in this juncture. And I go to take a breath, because I'm like, I'm about to spin out my hole. I'm so-and-so, and I'm blah, blah, blah. And I literally take a breath. And at that moment, the children in the neighborhood say, Mama, is this your daughter from the States? And she looks at me and says, yes. I have not uttered a word. <laughs> it's like Winnie Mandela just called me her daughter. But she had a particular connection, I think, um, in terms of the solidarity movement with um, people around the world who mm -hmm. she knew supported her and supported her husband. And she did have a particular connection, I believe, with um, Africans in the diaspora and with African Americans. She had a particular connection with the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. she, um, she used to always wear berets and, you know, the, the black power salute. Mm -hmm. I think within, um, within the cultural context of Johannesburg in particular, there was a very strong association with the Black Panthers, you know, and with some of that symbology relative to the civil rights movement. Now tell us about uh, her connection with the Martin Luther King Jr. family. Yes. So um, she was always very close to and had a great deal of respect for Dr. King and, uh, and Mrs. King. And on one occasion, um, when Mrs. King invited uh, Winnie to Atlanta to be the parade master for a, um, an annual celebration of King's birthday, um, Winnie was invited to go. And actually, that was a, another time that I went and did media relations for Winnie and, 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 and actually assisted in speech writing, et cetera, for her. And so that in some ways, um, Winnie saw the Kings as an extension actually of her family. That there, there was a very strong familial connection, I think, relative to the experience that she had as a woman, um, keeping the legacy of Nelson Mandela alive, felt a very strong association with Mrs. King um, mm -hmm. in terms of what she also experienced as the partner to MLK, obviously, the, the, the undisputed <laughs> um, leading figure of the civil rights movement here in the States. Very interesting. Uh, well, Professor Muyandu, what about you, really? Um, I know that uh, you liked Winnie so much, uh, if not, in fact, love. Um, how did you feel? I mean, wh what was your immediate reaction when you heard the bad news? 
of course, um, uh, it's good to be here with you and your viewers. Um, immediately, I was said, you know, say I still join my fellow South Africans in mourning um, this uh, gallant woman. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, I think we must say in this discussion that um, if we, whenever we're talking about um, Mama Winnie, we must uh, be cognizant of what apartheid was and how violent and and. It, the system was, and as someone who participated in its opposition, um, views about her will automatically be uh, polarized, mm. uh, and this polarization will be will often border on 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 whether or how someone felt about apartheid, and as that and as such, uh, viewers at home must know that even as she passes from this earth, those views that people had about her during apartheid, uh, they'll still have. Um, the people that she fought against who supported apartheid are still alive today in South Africa. And, uh, and so there is a narrative that this woman um, fought against um, in the war for her people, justice and so on and so forth. She lost the battle of information. That is why whenever we're having a conversation about Mama Mandela, the first thing we must talk about are flaws. She, because she lost the war, the battle on narrative. Um, we don't talk about those things when we talk about Mr. Mandela. And so there is a an African conservative patriarchy in this discussion in South Africa and across the world that seeks to police Mama Mandela's behavior and in a way that we've never seen uh, male politicians policed before. We never spoke about uh, the misdeeds while the people are still even um, mourning. But um, I just, I'm saying this just to, as a frame of reference mm. to our discussion mm. from my contribution. <laughs> I'm sure you know about um, the great Alex Heide, uh, the award-winning author of Roots, uh, the best, one of the best-selling books, really. And uh, uh, he also wrote, of course, uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X. He once observed that uh, you should really find something good in a person and praise it. Don't you think that uh, Winnie perhaps deserves the benefit of that doubt? Uh, more than most uh, people who participated in the liberation struggle, I think so. Uh, let us draw the map of anti-apartheid uh, scene between the 60s, 70s and 80s. There are four tribes. The prisoners are in Robben Island, institutionalized. There's no torture taking place there. They are with a group of their comrades. Prison is prison, but they still are in a fairly, in, in an institution. Um, there, there's no solitary confinement over there unless they, someone does something against the rule. Then the second tribe are the ones who go to exile. In the United Kingdom, in, the, in America, they study. They live fairly comfortable lives. But danger, of course, always lurked during apartheid. There's the third tribe. They go further afield in Africa. Uh, they are in Lusaka, less comfortable, but they're away from the imminent dangers of apartheid South Africa. Then there is the large majority of these tribes, the ones who stay within South Africa. Winnie Mandela represented these people. She stood side by side. In 1953, she was actually, when she graduated, as one of the first, as certainly the first black South African woman to have a bachelor's in social work. She was offered a scholarship to come to America, and she had to choose to stay in South, in South Africa, helping her people or come to America, and she chose to stay. So for, for, that re, for those uh, reasons like those alone, she deserves all the doubt and the skepticism that we can afford a person who's done so much for the country. Now, for, for a person really of your generation, you are one of the most you know, recent generation really in South Africans, um, how was she able to inspire you? A simple answer to that one. It's uh, growing up in apartheid uh, South Africa, growing up in the homeland of KwaZulu Natal, of KwaZulu, because apartheid for viewers at home, they will know that the apartheid government separated uh, into homelands. They separated different um, uh, places uh, in, according to tribe. I grew up in the Zulu one. In school, we were taught that Mandela would never come out of prison. He's a terrorist. We were taught this in primary school. And that the ANC, of course, was a terrorist organization. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And Archbishop Tutu, at, at best, was a troublemaker, at worst, an agitator against the state. We were taught that the people abroad, in other words, these people who are abroad, they've abandoned the country and they'll never come back. 
So the, the constant face that you always saw, given all things constant as far as the propaganda of the apartheid government, was Mama Winnie Mandela. So whenever she came on TV, my mother would switch off every other noise in the, in the, in the house and say, listen to your, to your auntie. So her death was kind of, it was like a death of my mother's sister. Mm -hmm. So if I, there is a perspective of an academic that I can share, but as a perspective of which you forced me to reveal, of a young South African boy. I'm afraid the time happens not to be our best ally. You are tuned into Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of a discussion in a moment, including our social media segment. So please, don't go away, because we'll be right back with you. Youth are not just the next generation of African leaders. They are today's leaders. And this is the time to invest in them. Today, not tomorrow. So let's connect. Let's engage with each other on issues that will transform our societies. Innovation, leadership, entrepreneurship, things that you're doing to move the continent forward to make you the greatest generation that Africa has known. It's up front every Wednesday, 1730 UTC, right here on The Voice of America. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. Call us now with your questions and comments. The number is 202-619-3111 and the U.S. country code is 1. Call us direct and we'll call you right back. Remember to turn down the volume on your radio or television and keep your comments brief. Now back to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, Esther, Esther Gizu, you word. And of course, welcome back to Straight Talk Africa, live from Washington. It's time to bring in our social media reporter, Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick. Take it away, Heidi. Thank you very much, Shaka. We've received great feedback this week. South African anti-apartheid campaigner Winnie Madigizela Mandela died on Monday, April 2nd, at the age of 81. She was surrounded by family at the time of her death following a long illness. Madigizela Mandela was a prominent member of the ruling African National Congress Party and a member of the South African Parliament at the time of her death. And this leads us to our question of the week, in which we asked... How should Winnie Madikizela Mandela be remembered? Let's start here with a tweet from Eric Namangalu, who tweets as one of the greatest fighters for social justice and equity, as a hero. That's all that really matters. We have another tweet from Emmanuel Cacele. Winnie Mandela should be remembered by both African men and women. Women in particular should remember her for her perseverance as an activist and wife. Men should remember her as the one who proved that women should not be left behind in any discussions and struggle. Now to our social media comment of the week from Facebook fan Kazar Waseth from Uganda, and he writes, A true patriot, Winnie Mandela also showed women in Africa that they have rights and should stand for their rights. Let's go to another comment from Facebook fan Gabriel Biati from Liberia, and he writes, Winnie Mandela will be remembered as the woman who fought for the freedom of blacks in South Africa. She demonstrated that a woman can lead in Africa. And our last Facebook comment comes from Karen Mumba from Chad, who writes, Winnie was a brave woman and true freedom fighter. Her name will remain alive as a symbol of a woman who wanted to liberate her country. Viva Winnie Mandela. And a reminder for you that we appreciate all of our audience feedback. If you are a new fan, do drop us a line at africatv at voanews.com. And to comment on our Facebook page, just enter the keywords Straight Talk Africa. And be sure to visit us online at voaafrica.com. To join our YouTube channel, just sign up to VOA TV to Africa. And you can follow us on Twitter at VOA Shaka. Straight Talk Africa also streams live every Wednesday on Facebook. Or simply go to VOA Straight Talk Africa TV program page that is on our website and to watch us live on your mobile device do download the voa mobile app now let's take a look at what's ahead for next week's program on the next straight talk africa 
Nigerian President Mohamedou Buhari says he will seek his party's presidential ticket to contest elections in February 2019, ending months of speculation about his future after spending five months in Britain last year being treated for an undisclosed ailment. The 75-year-old Buhari's stay in London triggered accusations by opposition groups and other critics that he was unfit for office. The future of Muhammadu Buhari on the next Straight Talk Africa. And that is all for today's social media segment. Shaka, you and the guests obviously have a lot of social media feedback to talk about, so I'm going to hand it back to you. Well, th thank you very much, uh, Heidi. And of course, uh, the topic today is uh, we're talking about the life and legacy of Winnie Madikizera Mandera and our distinguished guest, uh, Sandra Rutley, executive producer for TV video with the Futuro Media Group, and Dr. P. Wohure Muyandu, professor of African studies at Harvard University. Well, I have to say, Sandra and professor, that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled Thanks. to have the opportunity to host the two of you on Straight Talk Africa. It's a pleasure to be here. You're most welcome. Now, now Sandra, um, there are some people who actually say that um, Winnie Madikizela Mandela told us that you actually didn't have to be a man or you didn't have to carry a gun or an AK-47 in order to be a freedom fighter. Would you agree with those? I would absolutely agree with that. Um, Mama Winnie, um, you know, had a very, very challenging life in that it's interesting that her uh, tribal name when she was born, uh, Nanzamo, meaning, you know, one who struggles or one who has to um, experience trials and tribulations, I would say that she really kind of came into the world with that. And, um, you know, of course, she was first arrested in 1958 for being part of a women's protest against passbooks um, being mandated for, for black for black women. Was this uh, soon after she was married to the Madiba? Or it was just before. before. It was just before she was married to Madiba. Um, she was uh, subjected to 18 months of solitary confinement, a period, an experience that she said really changed her life. Mm -hmm. And obviously she was also in banishment from 1977 Blanford. to... Uh, to Branford in the yeah. Orange Free State uh, to 1985, and was constantly, um, uh, you know, under bannings and 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 constant harassment by the, the South African police. It's really interesting that one of your earlier commentators said that people did not see Winnie Mandela as a woman. I would say that that was that's patently untrue. Uh, that. Um, everyone knew that Winnie Mandela was a woman, <laughs> but I think that... She the, had two kids. She had two kids. Yeah. But the thing about Winnie, I think, is that within the context of that, from 1960 when the ANC was banned until 1990, there being really a leadership vacuum um, in the country, and Winnie filling that space, in some ways, the thing that Winnie's penalized for is acting like a man mm -hmm, and acting mm -hmm. like a male leader and mm -hmm. assuming leadership in um, in the full sense full sense of that word. I'm not here to deify her. I mean, she um, she was a human being, and there are things that she did that she herself apologized for. Um, but one of the things that I find kind of to be a, a, a big I can imagine challenge and contradiction in her life was that she invested so much in pushing for her husband to be freed from jail in 1990 when um, when he was released and at that moment in some ways it's almost like she lost her personal agency because then the ANC as a party um, began to mediate everything about her um, and in the same way that everything about Madiba, Nelson Mandela, every moment, every opportunity, every public pronouncement, everything was very orchestrated, that she was so used to really kind of operating with agency alone for that 30-year period while people were either in exile or in prison, that I think that that really created contradiction for so her and that, tension. So is that the reason why, uh, for example, she earned uh, the characterization of being a rebel within a rebellion. Well, I think that there are many ways, there are many ways that, uh, that, you know, Winnie did not um, have a lot of patience for, um, for 
for pretense. She was very action oriented. She, well, not only that, she, some people really viewed her as confrontational because when she saw what she thought was injustice and when she saw what she thought was a lie and when mm. she thought the people were were scamming the people or whatever, she would be in their faces and tell them. She was, wasn't necessarily the, dip, the most diplomatic person, mm. although she also was very effective in terms of as a public speaker and really knew how to codify information and transmit it. But at times, people did feel that she was very confrontational because, I mean, she was very, very critical of former President uh, Zuma, very, very um, critical of him. And or even, in fact, critical of the Madiba himself in terms of the deal that he cut Yes, she was. In terms of the Constitution and mm -hmm. the things that were prearranged, um, she she was very she was critical. She was critical of every president of South Africa, beginning with her husband, <laughs> and 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 feeling very comfortable in that role. And and I think that um, she did really reflect the sentiment from the grassroots. And at many times, we're actually mediating that when people at the grassroots were upset because they felt like economic change wasn't mm -hmm. coming quickly enough, that the redistribution of wealth wasn't happening, that they weren't getting jobs, etc. She would often be that bridge, not just between generations, but between the grassroots and different factions, even within the ANC, the black consciousness movement and the ANC, etc. So, um, that partly explains uh, why she almost became a mentor of Mr. Marema. Yes. Hmm? Yes. But what, Sandra, what about the issue of saying that um, she may, yes, have won the struggle against apartheid, but she certainly lost the struggle against patriarchy or male domination. What does that really mean? Well, I, I, I welcome, I welcome mm. my... Uh, uh, I, I would love to hear what you have to say as well. I think that there's already been a reference to the fact that um, not just within South Africa, within Southern Africa, within Africa in general, there, you know, there was a saying when you, when, you, when you engage a woman, you strike a rock. So that throughout the history of South Africa, women have always played a very activist role. But I think that um, when you look at the life of Winnie Mandela... She was not a conventional type of well, if, if you look at if you look the at Jomo, if you look at Jomo Kenyatta in in Kenya, if you look at Amilcar Cabral, if you look at Edward Mondlane, if you look at Samora Michelle, in some ways she was comparable in terms of really being a freedom fighter. The uh, Mkonto Wesizwe, the armed wing of the ANC, used to say all the time that Winnie always wanted to go actually on actual. Um, incursions with them because she wanted to physically see the dismantling of apartheid. She may have had on her matching earrings and had on <laughs> had, had on her gorilla gear, but she wanted to actually be there and to be part of that actual armed struggle. And so, when you look at at, at men in the history of the uh, the uh, anti-colonial movement and the freedom movement within Africa, that in some ways she played that role, but. Um, because of the ways in which women were still very domesticized, and she was constantly kind of characterized as wife and mother, which she obviously which was, she was, but she was more, so much more than that. And in some ways, it was much more difficult, I think, for the society to accommodate that bigger persona of who she was. I think, in fact, I have seen some evidence where you would say that uh, she probably even considered herself as a general, really. Uh, in the struggle, because um, I saw her in military combat uniform. Yes, yes. In 1990, I think, when they visited Uganda with the Madiba, and uh, they were visiting camps of ANC. Yes. They were, she was actually in military combat yes. uniform. She had, I, I used to tease her, actually, that, that in terms of... Uh, Fundraising that that she should have started a line of of, uh, of rebellion gear. I mean, she um, but she was very serious about it. It wasn't just superficial for her, um, and um, she was really kind of playing that role as a general. One of the things I want to say, and I, I really have to say, that during the times that I was at her house, she was bombarded in terms of people from the community with land issues, financial issues, employment issues, health issues. She, as a social worker, who was actually fired in 1958 for, for participating in a protest against passbooks, um, she, was a per she was a government agency of one during an extended, during a 30-year period. She had no infrastructure. She had no support. 
Um, and so she kind of held it down single-handedly. But she had uh, a very rich and powerful friend in Tripoli, Libya, Gaddafi. Well, I mean, she did have support from, she did have international support. There's no question about that. She did have international support. I mean, Gaddafi has played an incredible role as being one of the found, founding and funding members of the African Union. Um, so that, I mean, but Gaddafi is not the only person who, uh, who supported Winnie, right. especially when she was um, banished in the Orange Free State. Um, she was able to really be able to sustain herself through the support she received from the international community. Sandra, I have to say it, but um, time is not up this ally. And uh, you are tuned in to Straight Talk Africa to participate in our conversation. Please call us at 202-619-3111. This country code is one. We'll continue our discussion in a moment, so please don't go away because we'll be right back with you. The lyrics could be French, English, Portuguese, Bantu, Arabic, it is the beat, the African beat that counts, the beat does all the translations, it cuts across all languages and gives us the understanding that this is the African beat. It is so distinct and adhesive. It binds us together. African Beat on the Voice of America. For more information, visit our website at www.voanews.com slash African Beat. If you like today's show, please write and tell us what you think or give us some suggestions. Be sure to tell us what station you're tuned into. Our address, Straight Talk Africa, Voice of America. 330 Independence Avenue Southwest, Washington, D.C., 20237 USA. Or send us an email at africatv at voanews.com. Log on to our website at voaafrica.com. Or post your comments on Facebook. Keywords, Straight Talk Africa. This has been a victory for the people not only in the sense that I am now out on bail, but it means that the legal apparatus can no longer hold political prisoners in, in prison for long months prior to trial and attempt by isolating them and in many other ways to break their will to fight. We feel that this is something we have to do. The nation needs it. The movement needs it. Above all, the poor people of our country need a dramatic movement to at least get over to this nation the needs that they have. These groups have committed themselves to cooperation and committed themselves to following uh, the guidelines set forth of nonviolence and what have you. You have won a tremendous victory. We are here. once again to pledge our full support and to tell you, as we said at the Union buildings, that you are South Africans. You are going to vote as South Africans. We came to say to you, congratulations for being responsible for the collapse of a puppet dream. Incredible. Your reaction, Professor Miando, um, you've seen, of course, uh, some of the important uh, civil rights movement figures and what have you, and uh, there has been, in fact, uh, a lot of literature suggesting that uh, Winnie may, in fact, have been inspired by some of these people in the civil rights movement in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. Indeed, there's a long history um, and even tradition of, of sharing notes on strategies and tactics between the civil rights movement in America and the fight against apartheid in South Africa. And I would say Mama Winnie Mandela continued in that mold where we look to whatever the movement in America is going through, we see how they deal with things like how to hire a lawyer, just simple logistics of, of the struggle, how to um, bail someone out, how to stall when someone has been arrested and be, be, uh, without trial or they don't have a lawyer. Mm. Just simple rudimentary tools of how to wage a struggle. And those things have been shared across the ocean. Very interesting. Um, let's go to the lifeline of the show, which uh, I gather that uh, they're still you know, not, not on board. Um, let me um, ask you a question now. 
You know, when you look at uh, Winnie Mandela, um, she is uh, uh, struggling against apartheid with two daughters. One is, I think, Zeni, another one is Zinzi. Uh, Mandela is in Robin Island uh, or the other prison and what have you and does not in fact leave the daughters uh, as told really and by the time he is released they are very young women with children and all that kind of stuff. Don't you think that to some degree society uh, really uh, society owes some of these children of people that you consider to be heroes in your society long after the parents are gone. Huh. You have Zinzi now, you have Zeni, Winnie is gone, so is the Madiba. Huh. What about these daughters, what about their children and what have you? Are they beneficiaries or victims of their father's uh, struggle against oppression? I just want to say really quickly, I know you may want to jump in, that um, one of the things that the African National Congress decided early on was that um, apartheid basically was a structure that destroyed the African family. And so there were many, many, many families in South Africa that were n negatively impacted much in the same way that the Mandela family was. But in some ways that Winnie and Nelson Mandela really represented, I guess you could say, a case study of the highest kind of exposure in terms of what the impact of, uh, of apartheid was. And so when you look at the Soweto uprisings, when you look at the fact that the South African uh, intel so-called intelligence apparatus developed some of the most egregious forms of torture, even um, waterboarding was something that actually was developed in South Africa. The, the, um, the airplane, the uh, electrocution of children, mm -hmm. that these are things that the South African government perpetrated <coughs> on its population and to a large extent to a large number of children. And so I would say that, yes, Zanani and Zinzi did experience hardship, but it is so difficult mm. even to kind of uh, single them out because there are so many generations of children in South Africa who either bore the brunt of direct torture, being murdered, being shot basically in cold blood as, as the scenes that we've, we've seen from Soweto, et cetera, that it, I think... Yes, they do deserve our support and our love and our appreciation for the sacrifice that they made and their families made. But I would say that there are so many yeah. families made that similar sacrifice. Let's go to the life run of the show. And uh, there is uh, uh, Fiona from Uganda. Good evening, Fiona. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Well, we gather that uh, she's dropped. Uh, you to say I'll, I'll say um, it, these children would f themselves, w they were themselves uh, participants in the struggle. So they would be the first as good participants and good cadres of the struggle to say, no, we don't deserve special treatment, but honor our parents who did so much. Uh, and uh, speaking of that, there are no statues of Mama Winnie Mandela that I know of in the big, um, in the big cities of South Africa. There are no scholarships, there are no lectures, there are no foundations named after Mama, um, there are no buildings, there are no suburbs. We are thankful to Uganda. Uganda is the only country, Makerere University, that in January 2018 uh, offered Mama, while she was alive, um, a PhD, on, or, 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 an honorary PhD. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, no South African university has done so. And this shows that it's a very unique, I'm not sure if how unique it is, South African propensity to not honor its heroes. South Africans don't like honoring their heroes until they are, they, they are dead or until the world honors them. Lucky Dube is a clear example of, of, of such a person. Lady Smith Blank Mambazo is a second example. South Africans um, don't attend their concerts. What about but, Hugh Masekera, my friend Hugh Masekera? He's a rare exception, I would say. But uh, South African, like, so Mama M Mandela, many of these, the facts that her house in Brentford, where she was, um, were a classic example of how much South Africans, uh, at least the political elites, uh, the disdain that they've demonstrated towards her in, by action. In 2017, uh, a 14 million rands, that's one million, r roughly one million dollars, 
deal was supposed to be done for her house in Brentford to be turned into a museum. Long story short, the house still stands derelict, windowless today. That's let's, how much people thought of Mama Mandela. Mm -hmm. Let's go she to did let's go the, to uh, uh, the Tuli uh, um, Prize in terms of you know the highest national honor. I mean that was let, one thing that was given to her. Excuse me if you don't I'm mind. Sorry. Let's go again to the lifeline of the show, which are supposed to be telephone callers, really. Um, good evening, Fiona from Uganda. You're most welcome straight to Africa. Good evening, Shaka. How are you, Fiona? I'm fine, Shaka. How are you? I am hugely, um, I am hugely terrific. I love Mama Wendy. Uh-huh. I think she should be remembered um, for the fact that she did everything that an African woman is eliminated to do. She was the mother of a nation. She sacrificed. She sacrificed. So much for the country, she sacrificed so much but her cause will actually kill several of other countries and other parts of the world. One of the most amazing things about women is that as a woman, she was poor. She did not let her. I see. I think your point is uh, well taken, Fiona. Let's go to John from South Sudan. Good evening, John. You're most welcome straight to Africa. Thank you, thank you. How are you? I'm hugely terrific. How are you today? <laughs> yeah, I'm good here in South Sudan. I'm in Juba. Yes, sir. What is your question, please, or your comment? You have one minute. Well, I, I have a question to you all there in the studio. Mm -hmm. Will it be possible for the African leaders and the global leaders, because I see women as a global leader based on the nonviolence mission, she did it. She succeeded. A lot of young women are learning. Can you and your team in the U.S., in Southern Africa, Western Africa, Eastern Africa, come with the initiative to build a school for leadership for the young women of Africa, including the global women, young women? Can that be possible to develop the input where the leadership for nonviolence mission? should be inculcated to the young ladies and young girls so that also they follow the same full stop of Winnie Mandela. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Your reaction, what about that suggestion? That's a great suggestion. I think the South African, a, a, a quick start would be for the South African government to commit to this. The South African government must say for every street that it, or a building or anything named after uh, Nelson Mandela, honor him as, we, as, we, as much as we do. But for every street that's named after him, one or two possibly must be named after Mama Mandela. Because uh, so far the government has done an abhorrent job of honoring Mama Mandela. But um, she was not worried towards the end of her life about these things. She knew her people and she loved her people more because she knew them. She knew their essence and she knew that she had suffered and she had lost the battle for, 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 for propaganda and, and popularity. But she was confident that because of um, her children, she called my generation, uh, history will absolve her. That makes my point, in fact, because the next question I was going to say, what do you think needs to be done? It must be done in order to honor Winnie Madekizera Mandela. Well, on that note, thanks to our guest, Sandra Ratley and Dr. Fiwokule Muyandu, thanks to our field stations, along with our viewers and listeners. For many of our Voice of America radio affiliates, learning English is coming up next. And tomorrow morning, today, Break Africa with James Bate. On behalf of the Voice of America, thanks for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not bitter South Africa. And please remember to keep the African hopes alive. <laughs>